Welcome to Matters of Decorum. I'm Scott Corum. This is what matters to me. Rainy day, dark clothes, thinking creatively. Um, player characters break stuff. Long and short of it. Player characters are one of the most destructive forces in any universe. Player characters break things. And that's a wonderful thing. As a game designer or a game master, uh, you have a few hats to wear. You got a lot of hats to wear at that table. But amongst the things you are doing, you are uh, laying out a world, a world which ideally everyone at the table has already agreed on. We're going to play in this setting with these parameters. You have built societies and individuals and politics and structures and wheels within wheels there are plans in motion there are things happening and the thing that most of these things have in common is these things are in opposition to the hopes desires and perhaps lives of the player characters her characters are heroes heroes are defined by what they overcome uh, so, they have been given the task to be heroes because they are player characters in a role-playing game. That's kind of a stamp that's been placed on their head from birth. Whether they feel heroic or not, they kind of have to be the hero of the story. Even if they reject the appellation of hero, technically, they are protagonists and hopefully heroic ones. But protagonists, heroes, call them what you will, they don't exist to have a normal, healthy, happy life. They do not exist to live a life where everything is easy for them and everything works out the way they want it to. Uh, why should they have it any easier than any of the rest of us? That big burly guy in the pre-industrial society is probably not going to spend his entire life hoeing a field or tending sheep, as nice as that would be. Something's going to come and wreck all of those plants. All the nations got together until the Fire Nation attacked. Something happens. There is a reason for people to stand up and oppose that universe, elements within that universe, societies or plans or individuals within that world that you have built. The stories that you are going to tell together are based around that opposition. Even if the player characters end up flipping over and joining the opposition, uh, that is only going to serve to lead them to greater opposition. Well, thank you for joining me. I didn't think you guys were going to do that. Go figure. Now, there's this guy over here. He's the real baddie, and we need to take him down. So, I'm glad I've got your help, because it's going to be rough. There is always opposition. There's always something to overcome. There's always someone to beat or something to break. There's always something to break. As the game master, you probably start your game with some idea of what needs to get broken. Uh, you have thought this out, you've come up with a story, or you have read the adventure, and you have a fairly good grip on what opposition is there, what is causing it, why it is there, and at what points the player characters are going to be directed so that they can break it. The player characters have not read these instructions and will ignore them if you offer them. Not 100% of the time, 
Some groups are fairly good about following the letter of the adventure. Oh, we, the NPC that we met at the bar told us to go to this pass and to hit this person. We need to go and fight that or chief over there and then take the treasure from there to this castle. Okay, we will do that and get our experience and level up and go go, go do the next thing. It's a good group that does that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing in the world, but that's not my experience as a game master. Not for a moment. <laughs> to be fair, it is not my experience as a player, either. Oh, we go fight the guys in this pass, huh? How are they going to get there? They've got to be coming from this direction. Why don't we go fight them over there where they don't have any cover? I'm going to go fight this guy. Who's he work for? Who's his boss? Let's let that guy go and go beat up his boss. What if we let this guy go and we follow him to where he's going and then we beat them up there and take all their stuff to the castle? What if we keep that stuff? Is that stuff good? Why is it going to the castle? What does it do for me? All of these are questions I have been asked and asked in game. Um... Because the one thing that player characters break better than anything else is any plans you as a game master have made for what they're going to break. Game designers do not always have a complete grasp of the situation that they are laying out. Or they do not always present a complete grasp. Uh, here is a material that is super strong and all and almost impossible to beat, and they're going to use it to make armor. And you're going to have a chemist in the group. It's like, well, why? Why is it super strong? Is it have a particular high tensile strength? Is it oh, overly ductile? What's what's up with it? Is it is it carbon based? Because a lot of stuff like that's carbon based. Uh, it, it's not just graphene, is it? Because if it's just graphene, well, then all we have. To, I have studied a lot of things to put together comprehensive worlds, but I miss things like that. And I should, because I'm not 10 people. But you put you put six people together at that table, and something incredible happens. Because, yeah, they're playing a fighter and a rogue and a wizard and a sorcerer, but they're a machinist and a lifeguard and a chemist and a, a marketing manager and all of those points of view come with their experience their skills their hobbies their professional skills their knowledge and you get this overlay of reality on your game you get this broad perspective of all the stuff that can break because it's not just your bad guy. It's not just the evil sword. It's their societies. It's their distribution networks. It's how they transport things around. It's the politics of their system, their laws, their political structure, their diplomatic uh, core. All of these things turn into points of vulnerability when you have a player who even vaguely understands how to exploit them. Role-playing games have been an amazing educational experience for me. And I'm not just talking about how they improved my reading and my math when I was in high school, which they did, shot my scores right through the roof from, 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 from D's to A's. Um, but you have not played Talus Lanta until you've played Talus Lanta with an aspiring law student. Because I know things about reading the rules of role-playing games now that I had never imagined to that point. Um, you, you haven't played a Morrow Project until you've played Morrow Project with a mechanical engineer. Or someone with a very hefty military background.
You haven't played Mage the Ascension until you've played it with a psychologist. Because these become fascinating exercises in watching people apply their broad skill sets and their very specific skills to situations that were never designed for them. And having to be the game master who seems like you thought of it. Player characters break things. And you can't make it too easy for them. You can't go, well, I guess you're the expert. This happens. No, no. you've got to come up with a reasoned response, which is fun. It's a, oh, the, the improvisational game mastering skills you can pick up under these stresses uh, during play are incredible because you got to sound like you know what you're talking about. Rule number one. Rule number one in hypnosis, rule number one in game mastering. You always got to sound like you are in control. Not of the situation. You're, oh, it's not I can beat you in any game. It's the ability to sit back with calmness, nod and go, yep, I just as I figured. That's a very good question. I'd like you to roll for that. Let me give you an answer. That's that does that is my shorthand for holy crap. What what do I know about that? Give me a second. Roll. Can you phrase the question in a different way? Uh, there there might be something in how you phrase that question. Give me a roll. All of which is me having time to rack my brain, eat a Twix, drink a soda, and try to figure out. Hang on a second. Okay. When my eyes roll up, I'm I'm buying myself time. But watching how all of these different skill sets work, how every different point of view at that table works to break the situation, break the opposition, break your game. That's glorious. That's educational and entertaining and in every possible way. It is a beautiful experience. Uh, it's one of the things I love about role-playing the most. Player characters are going to break things. Player characters are going to break things in creative and fascinating and diverse ways. And watching how player characters break things is, is eye-opening. Um... I bring a lot to a table when I'm a player uh, because I like to bring a lot to a table as a player. I've studied psychology and hypnosis and political science, and I, I've studied all these things. Uh, writing role-playing games, I've had to pick up the anatomy, physiology, neurology, explosives, some chemistry. Um, probably gotten myself on a couple of lists. I bring all of this with me because this is now a toolkit for how I break other people's games and a toolkit for how I deal with other people breaking mine. If you are a new game master, you may not be prepared for this onslaught of additional information. You may not be prepared to fit your game into a framework that is other people's opinions of how their skills and knowledge of reality impact your fictional world. That's okay. But the sooner you get to a point where you can adapt, where you are listening to these things, where you're picking it up, where you're considering it. Because this isn't passive learning. This isn't just reading or listening. This isn't just trying to uh, randomly absorb information. This is working with it on the fly. This is, oh, that has a relative explosive force of 6.2. Man, that's, so that's like six pounds of TNT hitting this thing all at once. Um, well, that's cinder block. So, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's probably going to punch straight through. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. Uh, there, oh, the pressure wave, yeah, that's going to, that, that's, that's going to knock down everyone for about 10 feet. So, uh, sure, yeah, roll it. 
you you crave those moments. You are at that table to challenge those players. Uh, there, those players need to come up with how their characters are surviving, how their characters are overcoming that opposition. You are there to give them the feeling that they have been challenged, they have done some real work, that they have lined up everything the way that they need to so that when they pick up those dice and put them down and a random number shows up, that they have gotten their best possible chance for that to be a success. Um, and if that isn't, that they figured out about how they're going to survive the consequences. That's it. And that challenge that you're giving them constantly over that session uh, is, is, that's the rush. That's the involvement. That's the engagement. That's them playing the game. They are there to challenge you. They're there to challenge you with their perspectives and their ideas. And the game master has all of the advantages. I can just continually make bigger rocks until everyone dies. There's no fun in that. Now, someone throws something out of left field. That's what you're there for. That is your ability to be challenged. That is your time to shine. Someone throws you something. I was running for the Tuesday night game, and the uh, the group had to go into an eldritch church in New England, which is never a good idea. And one of the characters was a good Russian boy, and he went in and started to talk to them about what would happen if... It, but let me tell you about the Communist Manifest. Russian boy from a ways back. How does communism factor into your religion? I had two seconds. I had two seconds to make it seem like those people were prepared for that question. Because these were very, very advanced cultists. And they were supposedly amongst the most persuasive people. And I wove the Communist Manifesto into a theological doctrine in that two seconds, I gave a 30 second extemporaneous speech on how there is very little difference between the practice of worshiping the intellect in the sea and the ability of the collective to serve itself were not that diverse a set of beliefs. And, and when you leave someone, uh, someone who brings that up, because they're well aware of what they're asking, and they're, they're bringing this into their bailiwick, it's like, oh, well, let's talk about this. And when they blink a couple of times and go, wow, yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I got to roll. I got to resist that because that actually sounds pretty good. That, that's, 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 that's what you're there. To be fair, I have a fairly broad uh, area. Of, I, I've got a lot of areas of knowledge. And uh, I have practiced extemporaneous speaking for a very, very long time. But this is my practice for it. This is how I keep the brain sharp. This, this is how I keep the skills going and growing. Because someone brings something up, I'm going to grab that. I'm going to incorporate that into my knowledge base. And they're going to see it happen again in game. And people love it when they see that happen again in game. Uh, oh, I'm going to use this very specific set of skills. And I will find a way to make that relevant later on down the line. And there's that little glow that happens when they know they've added something to that world. And then they break it. Because now that's their that's their chink in the armor. That's the crack. That's the wait. I know this, and they go in and they break it, and they are satisfied. And you have given them something to be broken. You've shown them that opposition that is tailored to their skill set. You're giving the player characters things to break. I have occasionally been upset early on as a game master, early on, 
maybe later than early on, but for a while, I would work very hard to come up with proper opposition and backstories and artwork and and uh, and I'd slave over the character to optimize him for <coughs> exactly how much uh, badassery I could pack into it. And they last two combat turns, and then it's over, and they're walking over the body and not bothering to learn any of the backstory. And it pissed me off. I, I get mad. I would get genuinely mad. Like I went to a lot of pr trouble to do this, to make this thing here. And and you, you're that's how much time you're going to give it. Fine. So one, I learned to not put that much time into it. If something needs a backstory, I might have a, an outline, maybe. I might know where they came from. But my back, the backstory of a character will now come from what questions the player characters ask. I'll, I'll, I'll punch line those, those answers as we go and usually come up with something cohesive. It takes practice, but I've had it. Um, I don't put anything in front of player characters I don't expect to be broken. I put things in front of player characters I want to see broken. I want to see the despotic regime just dropped to its knees, lit on fire, and kicked into a volcano. That's beautiful. I want to see the bad guy who looks like they're wearing $500,000 worth of armor spray-painted with a powder coat from the BMW factory. I want to see that guy shot in the head from behind by a sniper who didn't tell him apart from any of his mates. Beautiful. That's all good stuff. A great fight scene would be good. Player characters are going to be endangered for longer than they want to be endangered. Some of them might not make it, but you know, they, they put a guy on a hill with a high-powered rifle. Okay, I'm good with that. I will reward tactics as much as I will reward bravery. If they can do provide both, sure, that's awesome. But, you know, cheating is the word. The loser has tactics. process of the game master setting stuff up and player characters breaking it is role playing that that is that is the provide opposition to be overcome so that the characters can progress you can sum that up when you set stuff up they break it lather rinse repeat over and over that is just the story structure it doesn't matter if it's a mystery or a puzzle or a treasure a curse an, uh, a bad guy, a political movement, a heist. You set stuff up, the player characters break it. You come up with a structure, the player characters break it down. That is the least important part of the process. The way that they do it. What they bring to the table to make it happen. How they use the system in ways you might not be aware that they could use the system. I wrote the victory system. I have players who are teaching me how it can be used every week. And, and I do not expect that to end anytime soon. These insights and this knowledge and these personalities and how people apply them at the table, whether they're playing the, the, uh, a character that is very suited to them or a character that they're doing because it is something entirely different and they want to give it a try uh, and you, you just watch how this plays out. It's what I love about the hobby. How it brings that diversity of thought and belief and conviction together in a single process. That process being breaking things. Well, thank you very much for following me along on this particular ramble. Um, I could talk about my love of role-playing and why it happens for so many reasons. Uh, I'll probably do it again sometime. 
If you liked the video, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, give me a thumbs down. Feedback is feedback. If you'd like to hear me talk about any other aspects of role-playing, things you'd like to hear me talk about, subjects you'd like to hear me cover, go ahead and leave me a comment below. Uh, I will love getting your comment. You will love leaving me one. If you have not subscribed to my channel yet, why not? My channel is awesome. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you do, please hit the notification bell next to it so that you're alerted when my videos become available. If you'd like to contribute to the channel in a more meaningful way, I invite you to hit me up my Patreon page, www.patreon.com slash scottcorum, and consider donating. Absolutely anything helps. It allows me to make better videos more often. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. I'm Scott Corum, this is What Has Mattered to Me, and I'll see you next time on the next Matters of Decorum.